Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. The housing market is in a terrible shape. Well, a wildfire can check your identity. Speaking your opinions. It's our culture. And do everything with love. So today is part number 13, technically, the, the second part of uh, part 12, but whatever, who's counting? And so go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Stand firm where we're looking at the letters and the messages from Paul to the church at Corinth, the Christians there. This is a church that he planted, that he loved, but he had to leave. He had to go plant other churches in the region, and so he, at, over time, got words uh, both in letter and in person that while they were doing good on many, many regards, there were some moments of drift where they, as a church, were struggling to uh, be in the world but not of it. They were struggling to keep sinful out of uh, the church. And so Paul, throughout his letters, and that we read a little bit in, in Acts and in First and Second Corinthians, uh, he is uh, admonishing, challenging, and, and uh, calling to task, so to speak, the Christians at the church at Corinth. And so last week we talked quite a bit about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to that because it really is the context for this message and it impacts all of us. And so today we're continuing in that vein about those of you that are married, though I would challenge all of us that we need to know what the Bible says regardless of whether or not we're in that marital status or we have something different. So for example, if you're here and you're single going, oh, this is about marriage, I don't need any of this. That's not true at all. Whether you get married or not is not the question. We should be learned believers that are able to understand and with boldness communicate the truth of God, not only to ourselves and those in our closest circle, but to the next generation and to those that are around us. We need to be equipped and ready to give a, a word of testimony for everything that we are and all all that we do. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Now, the very beginning, Paul said, the rest I say, I, not the Lord. So Paul is a, acknowledging that this is not a direct command from God, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't come with authority. Paul is an apostle. He is an early church leader. He sees the brokenness that was taking place, not just at Corinth, but all around. And he is, at, he is bringing his personal perspective about what is best for believers. And so Paul is honest here and says, this is, God is not technically telling you to do this, but as a father of the faith, whether he realized he was that or not, I'm telling you this is the best thing to do. So again, to the rest I say that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And the same thing, but in, you know, if it's a, if it's a husband and wife. And so we had this scenario at the church at Corinth where people were getting saved at such a rapid pace that it was changing the very family dynamics that were at play. So for example, there were some people that were, uh, that were followers of Judaism. Uh, and they were faithful to that, and they got saved. There were some that were Gentiles, or they, had, they were not followers of God at all, and they got saved. And then you take that into the context of marriage, and you would have one person, spouse, that gets saved, and the other person isn't saved at all. And so what was taking place, unfortunately, is the person that got saved within the marriage says, you're not saved, I'm leaving you. I'm, I'm, I'm walking away from this marriage because we are no longer equally yoked. I'll explain that in a moment. And Paul is saying, this is not good. See, there's this old lingering Jewish mentality that no matter how new they were in Christ, no matter how much they were saved in a brand new creation, it still kind of stuck around like a bad habit, which was this idea as these young Jewish children were raised from day one to believe that they were the chosen people of God, pure, righteous, holy, and every
everybody else are unrighteous, filthy dogs. So it stands to reason that if, let's say you're 30 years old and you've lived that entire life and you were taught that as a Jewish man in this example, and then you get saved and your wife is not saved, you're, you're shifting gears and going, well, now I follow Jesus. He's the completion and the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So now I am clean and holy and pure. And wife, you are a filthy dog. You can see where the tension starts to mount up a little bit and starts to rise to a feverish pitch. Paul's saying we shouldn't do that. In fact, I have a picture here of a dog that must have gotten sprayed by a skunk and then had to get a tomato sauce or soup or whatever it is, bath. And just, first of all, I hope I never have to do that with my two dogs. They're, they're both, both little fur babies, little lap dogs, they're both white fur, and that would be a complete disaster right there. And I, for those of you who don't know, a little home trick here, home remedy, apparently that helps take the smell uh, out of your pets if they get sprayed by a skunk. We got tons of skunks where I live. I don't know how my dogs have dodged the bullet up to this point, but uh, that's how you get the smell. Now imagine wearing what I am right now, right? A little bit lighter clothing, and I were to go pick up my dog out of the bathtub. There's no way that I would walk away from that without getting the tomato sauce all over me, right? The, the, the dirt, the, the, the red, the, the thing that stains the dog is going to be transferred to me. And this is how new believers in a marriage with somebody that was an unbeliever felt. And that's why they were abandoning their unbelievers. And Paul's saying, you, we should not be doing that. That is not what Christ has called us to. We must change our mindset. The next few verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14 through 15. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. I'll come back to that in a moment. The next verse, verse 15, is what we know as the Pauline exception. One of two reasons, or allowances, if you will, that God says that you can get a divorce. If someone does this to you, the first one is uh, infidelity or sexual immorality. If they are immoral and, and they are effectively have an adulterous affair, then you can leave that person. Or the second one is the Pauline exception. I'm not going to re-preach it. I, I covered that last week. That's why I'd really encourage you to go back through. Uh, and by the way, side note, probably the reason why uh, I had to split this message up. It has nothing to do with time management or message management or the clock. It has everything to do with I have so much tasty morsels packed into every message that you guys can't handle the full truth that I have to divide it up. You're welcome. Anyway, moving on. So <laughs> clearly I just didn't plan things out right. Verse 15, the Pauline exception, being abandoned by an unbeliever. So this is like the opposite. Paul's saying, if you're a believer, don't abandon the unbelieving spouse. But Paul now is saying that if you're a believer and the spouse does not, who's an unbeliever, does not want to be with you and they leave you, you are released from that marriage in the eyes of God. Verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. And so again, if you as a Christian are abandoned by an unbelieving uh, spouse, then from the perspective of heaven, you are released from that marriage. I think the language here is pretty heavy. You are no longer enslaved. For some of you that have been in bad marriages or in one right now, it can feel just like that, like you are imprisoned or you are enslaved into that marriage. But let's go back to verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Well, it feels like Paul is actually adding to the negative language. He's enforcing the negative language by calling people unclean and unholy, but he's not. This is where the challenge comes in. First and foremost, when he says that the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife in this particular example, what he is not saying is that that person is now saved. See, saving faith, which is a decision for you and you alone, cannot be borrowed, inherited, or willed to someone else. 
So uh, let me say that again. If you're a Christian parent, you cannot lend or will or with inheritance give your salvation to your kids. You can teach them, you can train them, you can show them the paths of righteousness, but no matter what, at some point, they have to make a decision for or against Christ, and they are, that, that can't be made by you. Just as much as a wife cannot make that decision for her husband, or vice versa. And so Paul is not saying that if there's a believing wife, that not by default the husband's saved and the kids are also saved. In fact, the word there, holy and clean, again, they do not equal saved. They do, however, uh, mean sanctification, being changed, being blessed, that there is an anointing that rests on that house because of the saving, uh, because of the saved spouse. So in other words, this is not a reverse guilty by association. Hear me on this. Those of you that are on the other side of this fence and you've got a super spiritual spouse and you have nothing to do with God or very little to do. I don't even know why I'm talking to you. You're not even in this room most likely. But if you're watching by happenstance and you happen to hear this and or I see you at Christmas, uh, let me just challenge you with something. Your righteous spouse who loves the Lord and is running after the things of God does not save you and release you from the decision that you and you alone can make to follow Jesus, submit to him, and all the days of your life grow in relationship. This is not guilty by association, or rather I could say saved by association. Everyone stands or falls on their own decision when it comes to their relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, one of many verses that reinforces this. It says, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It does not say repent and be baptized on behalf of your family for every one of you and then you will receive forgiveness for your sins. You can't take the sins of somebody else. The only one that's ever done that is Jesus. And so once again, Paul's saying that if you're in a house and you're the one that's saved, you actually bring blessing. You bring hope. And we're going to continue on that in a moment. But right now, to bring us to this next point, which kind of seems like I'm shifting gears. It seems like I'm getting out of the message and talking about something completely different. But my hope is that it will tie back in here in a little bit. To do that, I'd like to ask Matt and Brittany Holden to come on up here, and they're going to help demonstrate this message for me. Let's give it up for them as they come up. So uh, you know the deal. You did it last service. But what I'm going to ask is this. You guys represent a either dating or married relationship where what the word says is you're unequally yoked. What that means is you guys are, are not balanced in your relationship towards the Lord. And so for this particular example, Matt, I'm going to have you be the unsaved boyfriend or husband or fiance, whatever. You're, you're, you know, you're in this relationship and you are unsaved. Brittany, you are the saved one, clearly. I mean, <laughs> clearly, right? Okay. So the way that we're going to demonstrate this is you're going to while I'm talking, I got some scriptures to read. You guys are going to follow this out and carry this out for me. And so being unequally yoked means just like oxen where they have the yoke attached to their necks with the purpose of doing extra work to be able to accomplish more. We're going to tie them together in this relationship. So go ahead and lock arms. And Matt, I just need you to basically go limp. (laughs) Okay. All right, good. So you're dead weight. You stay limp. (laughs) Now start dragging him back and forth. You're you're basically like going on a walk. (laughs) There you go. Just keep going, and I'll do my best to keep everybody else's attention here. So, 2 Corinthians. So this is still Paul speaking. We're jumping out of first, going to second. But this is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. You're doing a great job, Matt. Way to be. 
just limp and <laughs> lifeless. Good job. All right. It says, do not be unequally yoked. There's no question mark there. There's not a, ah, if you want to. So hear me, this, especially this part, those of you that are single, that are dating or want to get, get married, or, or there is a sliver of a chance of you being in a relationship with somebody else, please hear me on this. Do not be unequally yoked. Other translations, instead of unequally yoked, it would say things like mismatched, bound together, tied up. That's what we see right here. He's just a lump on the ground, unsaved, not following God. She's all in, dragging his carcass everywhere, linked up, tied up, bound together. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness. Now to be clear, this is not just about marriage. It's talking about friendships as well, but staying on point. When it says what partnership has righteousness with with unrighteousness and lawlessness, the word partnership there can also be translated friendship, intimacy, and sharing. So in other words, we have no rights, we have no purpose, we should not be bound, tied up to, and partnering with lawlessness and righteousness. Yeah, this, this by the way, is why no one volunteers uh, for any of my stuff. Keep going, though, you're doing great. Give it up for her, she's going good. Halfway mark. Keep going. Here's this quote. And this might be a little bit hard pill to swallow. If Christ is truly the king of our lives... Our most intimate selves should be submitted to his influence. How can we unite a spirit-led soul to one in rebellion against God? This rubs people the wrong way because no matter how respectful, sweet, or loving, by the way, Matt, that's why I chose you, respectful, sweet, and loving, no matter how respectful, sweet, or loving an unbelieving partner is, he is at odds with Christ. He is in rebellion. Well, that, that's a wake-up call. That's sobering. And, and let, me, let me throw this out there. I'm so thankful that God meets us where we're at. And all the mistakes, even in the times of rebellion, when we humble ourselves and turn to the Lord, he will meet us every single time with grace, with truth. And if we continue to remain humble, he'll walk with us towards forgiveness and freedom from that. So if let's say you are here and you got married and this is exactly what it looked like. You're the one getting dragged around or you had to drag somebody else around. Was it the best way forward? No. But God can still, (laughs) no. (laughs) But God can still take whatever you give him and he can bring glory out of it. He can bring order to disorder. Though we don't want to charge headlong into it. Like, let's not make God work overtime here. Let's, let's not test the limits. See, right here we have an unequally yoked example. And here's the thing why Paul is saying this warning is not, much like people think God does this, is not to ruin your day. It's not to limit how many fish there are in the sea for you and your options. It's not to make you boring and miss out on the fun of life. The reason why God says don't do this is because what it produces on the inside of you and what it does to your life, to your future, to the generations that come after you. See, she's been dragging him around. This is why why we should flee from being unequally yoked in dating, in courtship, whatever word you want to use there, and certainly in marriage. Because an oxen, two oxen, that should be brought together And they're able to produce not just one plus one equals two, but they're able to produce exponentially more progress and strength and able to accomplish more work. That's what a a vision of a couple to a man and a woman that loves the Lord, that are yoked together and moving towards the kingdom things of heaven. That's what it should look like. They're better together. They can do more together than they ever could by themselves. But this is an example here, and this is what it does. Number one, it wears both of them out. Can, Brittany, can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> yeah. I don't even want to hear you complain. <laughs> You've done nothing. <laughs> Your arms, I'm sure, are sore. You're going to feel that in the morning. But it wears them out. It's, it could think of it. The, the, the believing spouse is dragging someone around. Come to church. Will you pray with the kids? Why don't you care? Why do you have to cut me off? Why, why don't you care about what, what I care about as a Christian? It's exhausting for the believing 
person. For the unbeliever, oh my goodness, lay off. I don't believe in your God. You keep nagging me about it. I'm not, I certainly don't want to follow after that, uh, the hocus pocus, whatever words you want to use there. It's exhausting. It wears them out. The next thing it does is it injures both parties. Over time, if you were, if this was like they were locked together with wood around their neck, which is what an actual yoke is, at some point they would be incredibly injured. They would be bruised, they would be bleeding, and it could cause irreparable damage. And finally, again, they accomplished far less together than expected or would have if they remained separated. So stop for right now. So all of that energy that you just put into that, if you took all of that and just stayed a single sister in Christ and ran towards the things of the Lord, would you not accomplish so much more than technically nothing (laughs) or very little? Yeah. Guys, let's give it up for them. They did a great job. Thank you. Let me rephrase that. Let's give it up for her. She did a great job. (laughs) So I trust that you're seeing, seeing why Paul, like a father, is trying to say these things. Don't be unequally yoked. Because now as a pastor, he's on the other side of this trying to convince married people that are now married to someone who's an unbeliever. It is better that you stay married because of the blessing that you can bring for your children and for your spouse. But please don't run headlong into that. And let's be honest, there are examples, and maybe your marriage is one of them, where missionary dating actually worked out, and that's good. Praise the Lord, you can use that as a testimony of God's favor. But just because it worked out does not mean that we should run after that as if it's God's first, God's best plan for us. Again, both oxen in an unequally low scenario will be worn out, injured, and will accomplish far less together. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3 through 4, Moses warned the Israelites, the people of God, before they entered the promised land, Cana, before they did that, he said, um, God speaking through him said, you shall not intermarry with them, them being the Canaanites, those that were unsaved, unequally yoked, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would be turn, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Well, if you fast forward to Judges chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, it literally says that's what they did. They went in, they began to marry their Jewish children to the Canaanites for a variety of different reasons, and, it, and the outcome was exactly what God said it would be, that their children would no longer worship the true God, the living God, but they would worship the gods, lowercase g, of the surrounding land. And so Paul is serious about this. Moses is serious. God is serious about this because of what it can do to us, our future. And so if you're sitting here going, okay, this still really has nothing to do with me. Let me tell you, especially if you have kids or grandkids, this has so much to do with you because you may have a past that differs from what the word says. And again, God forgives, he heals, and he can bring restoration. But you have a beautiful, important responsibility right now as parents to be training them up in the ways of the Lord so that when they're old, they will not depart from it. That's not only talking about salvation. It also talks about things like this. Children, this is why you need to first and foremost before looks, before finances, before their career, their talents, their personality, above all else, is this person madly, deeply in love with Jesus Christ and fully surrendered to him? That's the first question. And again, regardless of there's some examples of this working, willfully dating and or marrying an unbeliever is sinful disobedience with zero guarantees of that person getting saved. Hopefully they do. I pray for that. I will stand in, I'll stand in agreement with you. But there's no guarantee that because you're a Christian man that your wife is going to get saved. Right? And I actually wrote down here that willfully marrying or dating not only an unbeliever, but an underbeliever has at times the same effect. 
someone who is in a Christ follower in name only and has little to no fruit to represent the transformation that supposedly took place in their hearts. Sometimes that's actually more difficult than an unbeliever. At least an unbeliever is honest. I don't believe in your God and I don't follow after Jesus versus those believers that say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And yet everything about them, what they say, they think they do, not, none of it is a mere reflection of Jesus. In fact, it's just a reflection of the rest of the world that's around them. Sometimes those are more difficult situations to deal with because there's a, such a level of denial and, and, and willful ignorance that is baked into that. So either way, an unbeliever or an underbeliever, and I know that's probably a really unfair way of saying that, it dramatically, negatively impacts your relationship. You know, I can tell you, sadly, that some of the some of the most difficult moments for me as a pastor has been sitting right up there in the upper room uh, with, with, with a, usually it's a wife that is crying on the couch and so broken and so frustrated that their husband is non-existent in the church or in the family or in their relationship with God or is, a, or is an act of rebellion against them. I can see the brokenness on their face. I can see how exhausted they are and the pain that it is to, be the, to have to be not only the spiritual leader, but to be the only one that's spiritual and to be the one that's trying to raise the kids in the ways of God when they have the other spouse that can care less and doesn't show up at all. That breaks my heart because Paul encourages them as I encourage them, assuming that there's, there's no unrepentant deep sin there or, or uh, you know, an affair or an abandonment thing that the best thing to do is for the believing spouse to remain married to the unbelieving spouse. It's difficult. It, it's, it's not easy to say that because what you're telling that person to do and someone like me, my words rightly or wrongly carries quite a bit of weight. I know what I'm telling them to do in those moments. Not that it's thus saith the Lord. Like Paul said, I'm, I'm saying this, not the Lord. Like it's not a, you don't have to do this. But if you could see through the prism, through the lens of eternity and through the kingdom, you could see that maybe there is something the Lord is doing and wants you to partner with him on. And it could actually be uh, transformative in your relationship. And I want to, I want to, uh, give you a different example or a different way of looking at, at that. So I'm going to head out here and I'm going to ask Judah to go ahead and join, join me out here. And so we're going we're gonna to head out back here. I found this really cool toy uh, that I want to show to you guys. And uh, before we do though, it's kind of a space themed toy. Before we do that, I have a helmet right here, a space helmet. And uh, church, I can hear you out here as long as you're loud. This is Judah, by the way. How many of you want Judah, t- for this demonstration, to be wearing this helmet? Let me hear you. That was weak. Thank you, Tyler. Other than Tyler, that was weak. One more time. How many of you want him to wear this? There we go. You got to put it on. You're Spaceman Judah right now. There you go. There you go. You can head right over here. So this this sprinkler, I called it a toy, but it's kind of a one, and it's kind of two in one, is a spaceship that's connected to a hose, and as long as it's not windy out, which today, you know, at least we're at part of the building, it's windy enough, uh, what this will do is it will go up in the air, and it, and it becomes a sprinkler. It's really fun, and uh, I bought a few of them here just because they keep breaking on us, but uh, what this is an example of, what a picture of, is um, when and we see in First, in First Corinthians where there were people that were unsaved and one of them got saved and they were tempted to jump and shoot out of the relationship. Just leave it behind. They're saved. They're set free. They got a brand new spirit on the inside of them. The Holy, Holy Spirit resides on them. And they're like, you know what? Skip my unbelieving spouse. I'm out of here. And so, Judah, you ready? You're going to catch it. Hands open. Get ready. Here it goes. This is what we're tempted to do in those scenarios. Here we go. Get it, get it, get it. Oh, almost. Almost. Okay. So, that's what we're tempted to do. But God challenges us to do it differently and to think of it in a different way. Once again, as this is reset, God doesn't want us to cut and run. 
and to say, you know what? They're filthy dogs. I'm out of here. I'm just going to go serve the Lord. He challenges us that what, what, what would it look like if we stayed? What would it look like if we trusted God more than ever before and we didn't just see it through the plight that we have and through all the things that we're missing out on that you look at these other seemingly happy married Christian couples and you see all the great things that they do together and, and you're sitting here um, either physically by yourself, emotionally by yourself, and you're wondering, like, why, why, why is this important to me? Why, wouldn't, why in the world would I stick around? Well, let me show you why. I'm, I'm going to hope I get this right because it's finicky and it's difficult to do, so I might have to do it once or twice. So not quite as much juice as last time. Almost there. Oh, hang in there. A little more. There we go. I think I did it. Yes. Okay. I think this is a better picture of what God wants to do in those scenarios. Instead of taking the goodness of God and shooting up out of the relationship, what if you took the goodness of God and it began to live through you and began to permeate all around you to your kids and to your spouse and to those that are surrounding you? Or in other words, you can actually be a fountain of life. Instead of looking at all that you're lacking and that has been seemingly robbed from you, you can look at this as the greatest mission field of your life. Maybe you're not called overseas. Maybe you're not called on long-term mission trips. But what if God brings you there? Now, obviously, I'm going to shut this off because the chances of me getting that back up like that ah, is slim to none. But again, so this is the way of us thinking higher, looking at it from a better kingdom vantage point. Think think about what you can do. You're you're here, and as a rocket, you're in this, and you're spraying out the goodness of God. You're not just taking it for yourself and running. You're saying, God, I want to be a conduit, like a hose is. I want to be a conduit a blessing. And the word says there that, that your, your, your husband will be saved, your children will be holy. But really, but really what it's saying is that you can bring the goodness of heaven down here on earth. And so God wants us to look like this. He wants us to, as we pray, that we don't just do it quietly and, and, and every once in a while, but we become prayer warriors. It's like, like a fountain straight from heaven spraying out over everything that you pray for. And, and they, whether they hear it or not, you are, you are bringing a reality that doesn't yet exist into existence because you're saying yes to God. That's because you're a prayer warrior. What about you having the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, long-suffering, and so forth. That only those things, the fruit that comes from your, your interaction and your intimate relationship with God, it takes time and it's produced, but when it's there, it's truly a gift from God. What if that you were meant to not just have for yourself, but you were meant to give that freely to others around you? Freely you have received, freely you give. What about spiritual gifts? Think about all that we should be asking God for, not to build our kingdom or our name, and he gives it to us uh, as he wills so that we can build the body and build the saints together. What if if you you are a vessel that God uses for honorable things, and when the time is right, there's prophetic words or words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and all the different gifts that God brings to us so that our our unbelieving family's eyes can be opened and they can feel the touch from heaven. What about the spoken word? Reading the word of God and speaking it out and singing it out and writing scriptures and posting them all over the place. Yeah, they might grab those scriptures and throw them away. They might mock you. They may have no idea why you're doing what you're doing. But you remain faithful in the place of the word of God. And, and over time, those seeds are planted into their, the soil of their hearts. And eventually, there will be a harvest. I don't know what the harvest looks like, but God says he's not mocked. What a man sows, he reaps. There will be a harvest within that. And finally, what about your worship? To be that person that cranks the music up or sings in the shower that has a reason more than anything, a reason to celebrate. Who cares if you sing the greatest songs or you have a good voice or not? Just the fact that you can get up in the morning and say, God, I call you blessed today. 
when everybody else hates life and they're depressed and they're angry and they're completely consumed by the brokenness of this world, you get up and you sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And you begin to let your spirit well up on the inside of you and you, you worship God in spirit and in truth. All of this, I believe, is what God wants us to do while remaining as saved people in a marriage to someone that's unsaved. Again, you are a representative of his kingdom, and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means God himself resides on the inside of you. So the very presence of you sanctifies, it sets apart, it makes holy and brings blessing to the entire household. Now, I, I want to finish up here with this larger portion of Scripture. It kind of seems like it doesn't make sense, if I'm being honest with you. It seems out of order. It kind of, like, why, Paul, are you bringing this up? Of all the things that you could talk about, really, is this? But apparently, this is what was going on in the church. So I want to finish today's message with this. It says in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches— who was anyone at the time called already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Now, circumcision was a physical mark given to Jewish boys that was an indicator of the covenant between them and God. It was only in that culture, or primarily in that culture. And so what Paul is saying here is like, hey, some of you, as circumcised boys, and now men, you are saved, you're, you're following Jesus because he fulfilled all all of the old covenant. He didn't come to do away with Judaism. He came to fulfill it. And so here you are, you're saved, but you've been circumcised. And it says, let him not seek to remove the mark of circumcision. I'll be honest with you. I don't even know how you do that. I mean, I, I would challenge you not to go home and Google that. I'm just assuming maybe there was some way that they did that. Paul's saying, don't worry about it. Let, uh, let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts nor anything uh, for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. And so this is the first unique thing out of two that Paul speaks of. If you are circumcised or not circumcised when you get saved, Paul's saying it really doesn't matter. So the thing that was so important to the Jewish people before, God says, I fulfilled that, and you no longer need to do that because I circumcised your heart. I cut away and I healed and I, and I sealed your heart for me. And so this will make sense, I promise. Right now it doesn't, but just give me a moment. Verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. When it says called, it means into the condition or the status of life in which you responded to Jesus with that safe, or that, that faith prayer that saved you. So salvation, whether you were circumcised or uncircumcised, again, not really a big deal in our converse, in our context. Verse 21, were you a bondservant uh, when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. So here's the second thing, is a bond servant. Now, we look at slavery through the terrible, sinful, tragic history of the United States, which is a blight on, on us, us as a people. We look at it like that, and certainly that kind of slavery took place in the Old Testament, but by and large, what's being spoken about here is not a forced kind of slavery, but a willful, often lifelong decision to be a servant within a household. Why? Because they took care of you, they paid for you, they gave you shelter, and you worked. Yeah, you stayed there, and you worked for a certain amount of time, and oftentimes they chose to stay for the rest of their lives. And so what Paul's saying here is, hey, what happens if you were a bondservant and you got saved? You don't need to all of a sudden find freedom in order to remain saved. You now he's saying, now certainly if you can get freedom, by all means, why wouldn't you? But you don't have to do that. Verse 22, for he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So what's being said both in the circumcision and the bondservant, let me, let me try to land this, if you will, is that no matter what you are going through or who you are in context of this world, your joy, your strength, your purpose, who you are as a person, identity, should only be wrapped up in Jesus. Or in other words, you can be enslaved 
and still be 100% free in Christ. You, you can have all the marks of religious activity and all the things that you have to jump through that maybe your whole past has been one big long religious activity void of a relationship with God. He's saying that if you have all of those scars in your life, that's, that's one thing, but no matter what, you have freedom. And again, our strength and our joy should depend, depend on who we are in Christ, not our present status in this world. Verse 24, so brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. Will you go ahead and stand up with me? Whatever status you find yourself in, let me, let me say this a different way, because again, I don't think most of us are really struggling with being a bondservant or should we have gotten circumcision or not, but let me say it in a different way. Some of you, you have worked for the company that you've been in for years and now you've gotten saved or you even walked into it saved and you just are surrounded by so many, so much bad people that are that are mean and gossips and violent and and disgusting in how they speak and they steal from other people and there's there's backbiting all these things some of you you are inundated from the moment you get to work to the moment that you leave with just sin now god and paul are not saying that you always for the rest of your life have to stay in that environment because sometimes you are called to go somewhere else. And that's only between you and the Lord. And it, it is to your joy and your privilege that you seek out those hidden things. So again, I'm not saying that, oh man, pastor said, I'm forever stuck in this dead end job that I can't stand. I'm not saying that. But let me challenge you the same way that Paul did regarding a saved spouse in a relationship with somebody in a marriage that is of somebody that's not saved. What if you being in that job, in that school, in that uh, even, let's be honest, church, because sometimes church people can be terrible, and you being in your family, what if God has positioned you there, not like a rocket to take off to the stratosphere, but to remain, to hover, to reside, and to bring the goodness of God. Whatever condition you were called, in whatever condition you were called, let there, let him remain in God. If you remain in God and he in you, then you can go through the fiery trials of hell itself. And you can walk with the boldness, the conviction, and the very life of God where there's no weapon formed against you that could ever prosper. And you could be the kindness of God, the expression of God that leads people to repentance. Last scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 16. This is not a guarantee. It's not a promise, but possibly a hopeful outcome. Something that I, that if you want, I will pray with you for, and I will believe for you for. If you find yourself in a marriage with somebody that is, a, that is an unbeliever or underbeliever, let me encourage you and end with this. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Certainly, you can't save anyone. That's only Jesus. But what, what, would it, what would it be? What would it look like if you remain faithful and steadfast, immovable? What if you being positioned in their life eventually introduces them and walks them towards a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Paul himself says, hey, you don't know. I don't know. But I tell you what, the chance of that person seeing the goodness of God with you in their life is far greater than you being out of their life. And so wife, husband, who's at the point of giving up, co-worker and friend and, and family member and, and churchgoer who's sick and tired of the people that are around you, don't grow weary in doing good. For if in the end, if you do not give up, there will be a harvest. There will be something to rejoice. There will be something that God does that honors you and honoring him. That will be beautiful. And so, Lord, right now, I pray for every person that's here. God, I ask, no matter where they find themselves at, married or single, great marriage, terrible. Lord, and all in between, I ask that you meet them exactly where they are at. Every need, every tear, every frustration. God, every bit of brokenness, you are the only one that can take all of that, bottle it up, and bring something of value out of burned up matter, out of those things that are destroyed by the hands of man. 
And so, God, I pray that you give all of us humble hearts. None of us are above this. We might even have a great marriage right now to a wonderful, godly Christian person, but at any moment, myself or the other person, they themselves can walk into rebellion against you and choose to walk away from you. So, Lord, keep our hearts tender. Keep our eyes open that we might be people that always pursue you. No matter where we find ourselves at, we will always remain in you, God. I pray for strength in these conversations. I ask, God, that your supernatural mercy and blessing would be poured out in these families and in these lives, God, and that for these believing spouses that have given so much and and honestly feel like they have nothing left to give, that you would supercharge them in the name of Jesus, and you would infill them with your Holy Spirit, and you would equip them to do every single thing that you have called them to. God, that there would be no shutoff valve, that, that the flow from you would not be diminished, but God, it would be turned up, and uh, all the needs that are known and unknown within the household, God, that it will be watered from heaven through these faithful men and women of God. I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.